We call football the beautiful game, and while it is the beautiful game, there's still a number of issues within it, from gender equality to racism, from mental health to an issue that affects an unknown amount of footballers, dementia. So when did this become an issue in the sport? Well, it all started with one man in particular who played for West Bromwich Albion, Jeff Astle. In 2002, Jeff Astle died at the age of 59 because of dementia, according to the coroner after years of heading a football during his inquest. This was the first time a link had been made between football and dementia. After examining Jeff Astle's brain, trauma was shown right the way through it. The coroner also said that the verdict of the former footballer's death was industrial disease. In other words, his job as a professional footballer had killed him. And it wasn't until 2014, when his brain was re-examined and it was found that he didn't have Alzheimer's, he had CTE, or boxer's brain. That's when we wanted to know why. Yeah. You know, my dad was a footballer, how did he end up with boxer's brain? On April 11th, 2015, the Astle family set up the Jeff Astle Foundation, which was established in the memory of Jeff Astle. They use this as a fitting and lasting legacy to raise awareness of brain injury in all forms of sport and offer much needed support to those affected. In my previous school, Wellington College, with the help of the rest of the year 10s, my head of year and my classroom assistant, I was able to raise £485 for the foundation and I have been following the charity and the work that they do ever since. Since Jeff Astle, many other footballers have suffered from dementia. Footballers such as Dennis Law, Sir Bobby and Jack Charlton Martin Peters, Nobby Styles, Danny Blanchflower, Matt Tays, and the list goes on and on. So what's being done to resolve this issue? Well, research is currently taking place, but like everything else, it needs funding. Dawn Astle has campaigned for answers from the authorities since her dad's death 15 years ago. But are they out there looking for them? The PFA and the FA started a study back in 2001, which was actually before dad died, but I had an email off the FA to say, unfortunately, you know, it didn't reach its conclusions because um, they'd done it on 30 odd youngsters in the game and none of them made it as pros, so they fell away. So it only lasted a few years. So that was so bitterly, bitterly disappointing. So it was as if we, it collapsed, they thought we'd gone away and they just left it. And that's I know, wrong. I know you have had meetings that you have asked questions and they have promised you they would send uh, questions to FIFA and that was two or three years ago, and you're still waiting for answers, is that correct? Football doesn't, doesn't seem to want to know. Yeah. And it should want to know. It, it, it's not just about Dad now, it's about all these for, former footballers and their families who, who, have, who have come forward very bravely. I said it's not just about the past now, it's about football's future. You know, we've got to protect, you know, kids into the game, the fu you know, football's future. The PFA, they only exist for player welfare. They should be screaming from the rooftops for these players. This is killing their players. This should be their priority. 17 years after the former footballer's death, the PFA and the FA finally released new research and published their findings. This time their data showed that ex-players are far more likely to have dementia and motor neuron disease. Both bodies compared health records to ex-professional players from 1900 to 1976. And from doing this, they found out the former footballers are 3.5 times more likely to die of neuron genitive disease, 5 times more likely to die of Alzheimer's, 4 times more likely to die of motor neuron disease, but less likely to die of heart or lung disease, and are supposed to live 3 years longer in life expectancy. Even though research has finally been released, people and families believe that heading is still a factor, more research is needed, and that experts should confirm that there is a risk between heading and dementia. Universities in the UK have also been getting involved in the issue. Here are a few examples. The University of Stirling in Scotland have been doing sports injury concussion research. This university has created a lab controlled trial room. In this room they try to find out what happens after a brain's head comes into contact with a football. So far they have tested the trial on 20 players including Alan Shearer. University College in London has has found CTE in four more footballers' brains. Glasgow University has examined a total of 7,678 former players. 
and research has finally been commissioned by the FA. Well, football needs to get real, it needs to wake up, uh, it needs to get serious. Not next year, not next month, not next week, now. We're talking about life and death here and uh, players' careers, career ending. It's just not acceptable. It's been going on for far, far too long. We're on about trialling the substitute, concussion substitution. What's to trial about it? Why doesn't it? Why isn't it in now? It's been going on for years, this. We've been having meeting after meeting after meeting. Why do they need to trial it next year? Just do it. It's not acceptable. What I Every UK football association, except for Wales, have banned heading for kids. One club in particular have banned he heading for their young juniors, no matter their age rating, AFC Bournemouth. The US Soccer Association have banned heading for under 11s. This is something that the US Soccer Association and Bournemouth would like to see happen in the future in the UK for kids that play football. The Astle family, shortly after Jeff's brain was re-examined, sent questions to both the FA and the PFA. They returned with no answer for any of them. People believed that the two bodies were terrified of what they would see in the results after the study in 2001 was complete, and that is why it failed. The FA have also reissued guidance on football and concussion injuries. Not only that, they have also released leaflets for former players that have dementia issuing practical advice following diagnosis. This is the first time the FA confirmed that there was a link between football and dementia. A lot of players and family members think that clear action needs to be done, such as players need to be taken off the pitch if they have a concussion and a free sub or replacement needs to come on. A compensation fund needs to be created in order to support and take care of former players. Facilities are needed and a care plan needs to be put in place. There is no lie that more needs to be done in order to resolve this issue. Researchers and universities need funding, people believe that heading should be banned for under 11s and players and family members believe that clear action is needed in order for the sport to move forward. And whilst heading is an important part of the sport, we need to protect the players health and their welfare when it comes to head injuries and concussions. Trials are currently taking place but that's not enough. More needs to be done by the PFA and the FA so that the players feel safe within the sport. We call football the beautiful game but let's make sure it remains the beautiful game.